Uh, okay, so we finished the Wanderer. Now we look at the Seafarer. We're going to see some of the same kinds of themes. And we only touched on it the other day. But another thing that's going to enter in this one is the idea of pilgrimage. And it's kind of touched on in The Wanderer, especially at the conclusion. If, if you want to find permanence, if you want to find stability, seek it with God in heaven. So make that pilgrimage, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> so The Wanderer begins... I can sing a true song of myself, tell of my journeys, how in days of toil I've often suffered troubled times, endured hard heartache, come to know many of care's dwellings on the keel of a ship, terrible tossing of the waves where the anxious night watch often held me at the ship's stem when it crashes against the cliffs. Right? I can sing a true song of myself. I am able to reveal this true story the speaker is saying. Okay. So what I'm going to tell you is not fiction. It's truth. Not fiction slash it's truth doesn't mean it's fact. Okay. The difference between truth and fact. I'm going to sing to you a true song. That is, there is truth in what I am saying. So, tell of my journeys, how in days of toil, the old English there, you slink dagum. Um, if you ever have a chance to take a course, there's a lower division, uh, not lower division, there's an undergraduate course just in Chaucer, for example. Take take the, short, the course in Chaucer and you know, you will see that verb used a lot in Chaucer, swink, okay? to work, to toil away at something. So in days of toil, but it specifically means, or what it really means is earthly life. Earthly life is days of toil, all right? I've often suffered troubled times, endured hard heartache. Come to know many of Kira's dwellings on the keel of a ship. So the speaker is kind of telling us he spent much of his life, or possibly she, but more than likely it's he, much of his life in a ship. We don't get a description of the ship. We're not talking, you know, the Titanic or the QE2 or the Queen Mary or something like that. We're talking small boat. In fact, we're going to hear a little bit later on give some indication as to how small a boat. This is a single person boat, right? So what's the experience? What have caused, you know, many of Care's dwellings? The terrible tossing of the waves, where the anxious night watch often held me at the ship's stem when it crashes against the cliffs. Now, the anxious night watch, you might read that and say, Oh, well, he had the watch of the night. Somebody else had the watch during the day there. He was able to sleep. It's possibly what it means. More than likely what it means is he was awake during the day, but he also had to stay awake at the night at the stem of the ship, the bow. Why? Because he was so close to the cliffs, and he didn't want to go crashing into the Pinched with cold were my feet, bound by frost. Why? Literally bound by frost, were his feet literally encased in ice? Probably not. Why would his feet be bound by frost? If he's in a smaller ship slash boat, as I'm suggesting, water's coming in over the sides. And if the air is really cold, what will that water do on surfaces? It'll freeze quickly. 
The ocean won't freeze. Okay. But the water as it splashes in will. And if his feet are not totally submerged, ice will form on the leather of his shoes and such. Right? Were my feet bound by frost in cold fetters, while cares seethe hot around my heart. So notice his feet are bound in frost while his heart is doing what? Look at that verb. Seeds. We don't use that very often in cooking anymore. It is originally an old kind of cooking term. To seethe something is to boil it. So his heart is boiling while his feet are freezing. There's a disconnect, so to speak, between body and soul. The body's freezing, but the heart is consumed by something else. While cares, notice the cares are seething hot around his heart. It's, it's these, I hate to use this word because the modern connotations of it um, are too wild. His emotional state, his emotions are running rampant, so to speak. All right. While care seeds hot around my heart and hunger gnawed my sea weary mind. What? Why does hunger gnaw at the mind? I thought hunger was down here in the belly. How, do you, how does your mind hunger? Might hunger for knowledge, meaning, okay? But I think he's referring to hunger, hunger. And it's gnawing at his mind because what's the mind doing? What, what's his mind thinking? Where am I going to get my next food? Where am I going to get my next meal? Where is he? He's on the ocean. It's, it's not like he's going to you know, pop into Burger King or whatever. That man does not know. Beginning of a gnomic passage. That man does not know. What man? He whose lot is fairest on land. So, the person whose lot is fairest on land. Fairest is superlative. So, literally, it would be the person who has the greatest life on land. Literally. Metaphorically or symbolically, what's it mean? Just the person who lives on the stable plot of land, on the stable earth. Okay? That man does not know, he whose lot is fairest on land, how I dwelt all winter wretched with exile. Why does the person on land not know that, not understand that? Because the person whose lot is fairest on land is living where during the winter? <coughs> Think of Bede's explanation by <coughs> one of the priests to King Edwin. Not Coifey, it's one of the other priests. He says, the life of man is like what? And he says, there's a hall and it's winter time, and snow and wind and rain outside, and a sparrow flies through one door. And the life of man is like that sparrow when it's inside the hall. There's song, there's revelry, there's heat, there's warmth, there's beer, there's life. It's easy in there. Either side of the hall, it's hell, essentially. And it's unknown. He says, the person whose lot is fairest on land is what? Comfortable. That person has heat, has warmth, has food, has drink, has a place to lay his head and such. He doesn't know what? How I dwelt all winter wretched with exile. Wretched. A line there, line. 14. 
Um, I winter wanted a winter dwell wretched lastum in the tracks in the tracks of wretchedness. <laughs> the we've seen it before. We saw the word rapclastas. The the last there refers to like a footprint. Okay, when shoes are made. Shoes are made according to different sizes. That, that sizing in the shape of the, the print of the shoe, it's called the last. L-A-S-T. Right? So it's modern English use of that very old English word, using it in its exact same original sense. So he goes on. Uh, wretched with exile on the ice-cold sea, in the paths of exile. We go all wrong. Yeah. In the paths of exile, deprived of dear kinsmen. Ah. So, if he's on the path of exile, because he was deprived of dear kinsmen, they were killed or something, like in the wanderer, or is he deprived of kinsmen because he's in the path of exile? See the difference? If he's deprived of kinsmen, then he is in exile. But you can be in exile, and your kinsmen can all still be alive. Which is the cause and which is the effect? Now you've got a gloss down at the bottom. Deprived of dear kinsmen, why don't you continue? There it is. A half line may be missing here. There is no break in the manuscript or in the sense of the poem, but the line has only two stresses instead of the expect, uh, expected four. The old English reads, Winter wounded the erecting last room, that's line 15, and then Wina Magum the Droran. Wina Magum. Dear kinsmen, bedroren, deprived of. All right? Hung with icicles of the frost, while hail flew in showers. The hung with icicles of frost applies to what? The I referred to two lines above. While I hung with icicles of frost while hail flew in showers. In order for icicles to form, what does the thing they're forming on must be? It's, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to respond to that because it's poor English. Um, icicles can only form on something stationary. It can't be moving. So his implication is, he, while he's in the little boat, he's kind of frozen. But what happens the colder and colder and colder you get? Your body gets sluggish. You get lethargic. Read um, To Build a Fire by Jack London. About two guys in the Yukon. They're out you know, prospecting or something like that. It's winter, and they're going to make their way back to their cabin. One's going to go one direction, the other one's going to take a shortcut. Don't take a shortcut in the middle of, middle of winter in the Yukon. One of the things that happens is that guy falls in some water, gets his clothes sopping wet, if I remember, he breaks his leg or something. Okay? And his dog sees him, but his dog won't come close to him. Because he is starting to die. And he starts to die from his feet up. He starts losing feeling in his feet. And he gets very lethargic and sluggish. His dog stays away because his dog knows he's going to try and kill me. There's one, you know, there's the reason there's a reason why in Empire Strikes Back, we get that opening scene where Obi-Wan saves Luke, throws him in the whatever the big thing's called. That idea is in Jack Lemons to build a fire. He's got frost hanging from him because he's frozen. He's still. Well, 
bicycles in your cupboard, sorry. I heard nothing there. That is, during the winter, in my exile on the sea, but the noise of the sea, the ice cold waves. A wild swan song sometimes served for music. The gannets call and the curlews cry for the laughter of men. You know, he gives us a list, if I remember correctly, about five different birds, five or six different birds. The seagulls singing for me to drink. I heard nothing but the noise of the sea. But then he tells us he hears something else. What's the other things he hears? He mentions birds. The wild swan's song sometimes served for music. So he hears the swan, and it's like music. He hears the gannet and the curlew, and they're like the laughter of men. How so? Why does he interpret for us these songs of these birds as the kind of sounds you would hear in a hall? That's what he's missing? That's what his mind's focusing on? Is that what the hunger is? Could be. What else? Yes. I was thinking like birds are loud and obnoxious because that's how the men in the hall would be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because the men in the hall would often be drunk. Okay. What else? What does it mean they served for? They served instead of the sound of singing. The sound of laughter. So they stand in for those things. Is that him imaginatively reaching out and saying, oh, thank you, Swan. I needed that song. Thank you, Gannett and Curly, to make me think of the laughter of my friends. Is it that kind of thing where he's actively involved? Or does he hear these sounds? Oh, it's like I'm back in the hall again. Storms beat the stone cliffs. The turn, another seabird, answered. Icy feathered, the, sea, the eagle screamed. Dewy feathered. No sheltering family could bring consolation to my desperate. It's like he's partially aware these are birds. How is he fully aware that they're not birds? They don't bring him any comfort. They don't bring him any solace. Notice none of the birds says, come, sit by me, have a beer, pull up a log next to the fire. If they were really his friends, his family, his kinsmen, then what? The heartache would be gone. Right? But he's still a wretched exile. And so, Gnomic passage, he who has tasted life's joys in Christ. Notice the verb tense there. He who has tasted. It happened in the past. It began and ended in the past. It's not, and he who is tasting, okay, present progressive. He who has tasted life's joy in towns, suffered, he who has suffered few sad journeys, that person scarcely believes. Scarcely believes what? Proud and puffed up with wine. Okay, so that person has tasted life's joys in town, has suffered a few sad journeys, is proud and puffed up with wine. What's it mean, puffed up with wine? It can't mean literally drunk. It can mean what else? What, 
what are some dude, whether you've been drunk or not doesn't matter because you see people or you've seen movies and such where you see drunk what do drunk people often do other than make fools of themselves they boast they say things they shouldn't say they they claim things they have no reason to claim not like I claim this but they make claims about themselves right that's the proud and puffed up with one you know makes you think what I'm invincible I can do XYZ they or he scarcely believes what I weary again what does weary really mean it's not just you know I didn't sleep well last night it doesn't just mean oh I didn't sleep well last night it means you didn't sleep well last night the night before the night before the night before or in the last 30 days, you're worn out. You're, you know, you're on your last leg, so to speak. What I, weary, have often had to endure in my seafaring. Why does he scarcely believe that? The person back there happy on the land. He's never experienced that. Scarcely believes doesn't mean doesn't believe. It means he has difficulty believing that. Right? Because each of us cannot have an experience that someone else could have. But we can kind of understand. We might have been in something similar, not the same. The, the other day, you know, and I'm not I'm not being political here. I'm just this is an example that works. The other day when there was the what's called the dignified transfer of remains, when the 13 uh, service members' bodies were flown back from Afghanistan, some of the families spoke with President Biden afterwards. And what a couple of the families said was, Biden said, you know, I understand what you I know what it's like to lose. A child and they were saying no you don't your son died of brain cancer my son or daughter one woman in the service died because of a suicide bomber totally different yes your son served in Iraq so you understand what that's like but it's not it's close, okay? Scarcely believes it's, it's close, but it's not exactly the same. So the speaker says. And, and notice, what I weary have often had to endure in my seafaring. What has the speaker not told us yet? We're 40, 30 lines in, almost. Am I that far? Yeah, 30 lines exactly. Why is he seafaring? Why is he out in the ocean during the middle of winter? In Britain, we're not talking being in the middle of the ocean in, you know, in the Caribbean during winter, where the water temperature drops to, I don't know, like 70. Ooh. We're talking the North Sea. I'm from California. The, the coast near where I'm from, Santa Cruz, you know, when, when my wife came out, we were uh, engaged at the time, and I said, you know, we're going to go to the beach, or it might have been a short day after we were married. She was like, cool, she's from Jacksonville, Florida. She's used to warm ocean water. Well, this was, in fact, it was after we were married. This was June or July, and she's thinking, great, you know, and I'm putting on a sweatshirt. We're going to the beach. I'm like, yeah. Well, we get there because I had never thought to tell her. The water off Santa Cruz in summer is like 55 degrees. And she's thinking it's going to be like 85 degrees like it is Jacksonville, right? The night shadow darkened. Same phrase we heard, by the way, used in the wonder. The night shadow 
that as the darkness of night darkened, it got pitch black. Snow came from the north. Frost bound the ground. Hail fell on earth. Coals of green. So, pretty bleak winter picture. And so, and you've got a footnote for the end, so as she did for line 27. The Old English is fourth on, if I remember correctly, did she say? Yeah, the Old English is fourth on. It can be translated a half dozen different ways. It can be and so, it can be since, it can be because, it can be therefore, it can be thus. And each one of those has slightly different meanings. And so they compel me now. They what? My heart thoughts. Heart, what do you mean heart thoughts? Heart's down here, thoughts are up here. The urgings of the heart, right? To do what? To try for myself. To try for myself. I'm going to come back to that. The high seas, the tossy salt streams. Excuse me. My heart's desire urges my spirit time and again to travel so that I might seek a foreign land somewhere far from here. <clears throat> to try for myself. What does that verb, to try, mean? To do, not according to Yoda, <laughs> to attempt. What else? What's the noun form of this? So this is the verb. The noun form of that is trial. Not like a similar to, but not like a legal proceeding trial, but like a, oh, I don't know, vaccine trial. Why are there vaccine trials before we can get the vaccines? See if they're going to kill you, you know, by accident. See if there's any danger. See what side effects are, blah, 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 blah. Okay. To try, to attempt, to prove, to test. Leaving these two out for a moment, these two words, they mean the same thing. And the test there, that's like test in test tube. Okay. Know where they both come from? What branch of science, so to speak? Alchemy. A test is something to prove something. When you're proving something, you're determining what it is. You're looking at its essence. So when he says, his heart thoughts do what? To try for myself, to attempt for myself, to prove myself, to test myself. Listen to mountaineers. Why did you attempt Annapurna, you know, one of the highest mountains in the world? Why did you attempt K2? Why, the big daddy of them all, did you climb Mount Everest? And some of them will give the stupid, trite answer. Because it's there. Back when I was running a lot, you know, marathons, half marathons, I always wanted to do an ultra marathon. Ultra marathon is anything over 26.2 miles. There's, there's one down near the Jack Daniels Distillery. can't remember what it's called. Something, some guy's name. Run. It's a 40-mile run. Then there's 50-mile ultras and 60, etc. 
And the big one is the Badwater Ultramarathon. I remember the distance. 100 plus miles. And you go from Badwater, Death Valley, lowest place in the continent of the United States, and it's run in the middle of July. Hottest weather in the United States. It's from there, I think it's 112 miles. From there to the top of Mount Whitney, the highest point in the 48 states. It's like a 14,000, 15,000 foot elevation difference. And you have to be able to complete it in 24 hours. There's a guy locally. He's in his 70s, late 60s, early 70s now. He's run it like, I don't know, a half dozen or a dozen times. Latest time was after having his hip replaced. The guy is just a beast when it comes to running. But people's shoes literally melt as they're running. I've, if you've ever been through Death Valley, you know what I'm talking about. I've driven through it many times. Okay? So, why would you do this? Why would somebody run a marathon? Okay. He said to test himself. Eskasis, the Greek word, and it means, well, essentially, it's to test oneself, to prove oneself, to try oneself, and ultimately to deny oneself. That is to push. To say there is something greater, okay, than the self. You know, the marathon. What, what is trying to stop you? What is trying to slow you down? Your body says, mm, 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 mm. and you, everybody who runs a marathon reaches the point where they hit what's called the wall. Each person, it's a different mileage. Some people hit it 18 miles. Some people don't hit it till 25 miles when you. 1.2 miles left to go. Okay, some people hit it earlier. And usually what it means is that's when everything in your body says, stop. And you got to push through. Right? To try for myself what? The high seas, the tossing salt streams. That is, to prove myself in these. My heart's desire urges my spirit time and again to travel. Now, that sounds nice. Call up your AAA, your travel agency. I want to go traveling. It's a lot harder now because of COVID. You know? So that I might seek, ah, now we find out why he's on the sea so much. So that I might seek a foreign land somewhere far from here. Why? Why would you want to seek a land far from here, wherever the here is? Because we don't know where the here is at this point. Is he so fed up with his lord, his leader, his country, that, you know, I'm going to rip up my passport, you know, move to, I don't know, wherever, Colombia or France or, you know, Poland? We don't know yet. But he's going to seek somewhere else. And so, no man on earth is so proud in spirit. I'm trying to figure out where to stop. Um, we got a few more left. No man on earth is so proud in spirit, nor, nor so gifted in grace, nor so keen in you. Notice, he's giving attributes. Okay? So, proud in spirit, Gifted in grace, keen in youth, keen meaning sharp, bold in deeds, beloved of his Lord, that he never has sorrow over his seafaring. No one on earth, he doesn't mean their land. He means the earth. There is no one alive right, who is so proud of the 
spirit, so gifted to God, that he never has sorrow over his future. Everyone who must travel on the sea, what? Has sorrow. That's kind of telling us we're not just talking about traveling on the sea. Come. Okay. Sorrow in his secret, over his secret. Come. When he sees what the Lord might have in store for him. Why does he not have sorrow when he sees what the Lord might have in store for him? He's saying, even the person who is proud in spirit, even the person who is gifted in grace, even the person who is keen in youth, even the person who is bold in deeds, even the person who is beloved of his lords, will have sorrow. Or, it, or, or the person who has all these things so that he never experiences sorrow in his whatever the seafaring is what? when he sees what the Lord who's the Lord? notice in your text it's capitalized the old English wasn't the old English just read just had the word drifting maybe spelled a little and it just means Lord. It can mean earthly Lord, King. It can mean heavenly Lord. All right? So go back and look at it. I'm going to read it again, the entire passage. And so no man on earth is so proud in spirit, nor so gifted in grace, nor so keen in youth, nor so bold in deeds, nor so beloved of his Lord, that he never has sorrow over his seafaring. That is, he will have sorrow over his seafaring. When he sees what the Lord might have in store for him. So the seafaring is more than just seafaring. He's going to have sorrow. What's that when he sees what the Lord has in store for him? That's the end purpose, so to speak, of life. Where is that? When life comes to its end, when he sees what, let's be trite, what God's plan is for his slash her life. Even if you're proud in spirit, you're going to have some sorrow. Even if you're bold in deeds, you're going to have some sorrow. Even if you're young, you're going to have some sorrow. Even if you're blah, 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 blah. Whatever. Once you see what the purpose is, what the meaning of life is, you're going to experience sorrow in all of these things. Right? He, the person who understands this, has no thought of the harp or the taking of rings. What, is, what do the harp and the taking of rings symbolize here? What are they an aspect of in Anglo-Saxon culture? What did I say is at the center of society? The hall. Okay. The harp is what gets passed around the table. Remember B? Cadman's sitting there. It's a monastic hall. Okay. They supposedly have their eyes on the prize, you know, heaven, but still the heart comes around the table. The heart is what all the songs are accompanying. So it represents that revelry, that joy in the hall, right? Or the taking of rings, that's the distribution of gifts by the Lord, by the, by the gold giver, the gold friend. nor the pleasures of woman. So, harp, gold, sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know. 
nor joy in the world. So we get specific joys, the heart, the gold giving, flesh, pleasures of the flesh, nor just kind of unnamed joys of the world, nor anything else but the tumbling waves. He who hastens to see always has longing, longing, desire. But what does every desire have? It's a desire for what? Something. There's, it's something that is lacking that is wanted. Wanted in both words, in, in both meanings. Lacking and needs to be had for that lack to be full, to be complete. St. Augustine says in his Confessions, took him a long time to realize he had a hole in his soul that was God-shaped. Only God could fill it. Okay? He tried all kinds of ways before his conversion. I mean, Hugh Hefner, Hugh Hefner was nothing to Augustine before his conversion. Right? So, he who has, excuse me, he has no thought of the heart, the ring, pleasure of the woman, joy in the world, nor anything else but the tumbling wave. He who hastens to see always has longing. That is, none of these things, the heart, the rings, the women, the joy, none of those fulfill the desire. There's something else. Or as Bono put it in one of U2's most famous songs, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. There's, there's something more. The groves take blossom. That is, spring comes, the trees bloom. The cities grow fair. The fields brighten, the world rushes on. Time runs on apace. All these urge the eager-hearted spirit to travel. Notice, springtime. Chaucer begins, Canterbury Tales, Juan de Caprida with his sure sofa, the drach of Mercha hath perced to Togarota. When April with his sweet showers pierced the drought of March. That is, the rain comes, the still deadness stops, and then what happens? Trees start to von ten lines later, von longen folk to go on unto the lodges. And then people want to go on pilgrimages. It's when, then. Well, what's the when then getting at? What do you see happen in PSU, any university campus in the United States? What do you begin to see happen down here in the South, usually, you know, first couple weeks in March? How do people start to dress a little differently? Short sleeve shirts, shorts, crop tops, tank tops, sometimes just bikini tops come out. Why? It'll be warm for a couple days. We'll hit 80 and you know, all inhibitions aside. Why? February in its cold, dreary, blech. February's, you know, the cruelest month, even though TSL 8 said April was a cruise month. It's crappy weather. Right? That's kind of what he's getting at. The weather turns nice, and you want to leave. You want to get out. Cabin fever, you know, releases us, so to speak. All these urge the eager-hearted spirit to travel when one intends to journey far over the flood wave. That is, and that's when one desires Wanderlust, you know, rises within. Even the cuckoo urges with its sad voice. Summer's guardian ounces sorrow, 
bitter in the breastplate. What's the sorrow that the cuckoo bird announces? Fall asleep. Winter is coming. Live now. He does not know who's the he. It's not the cuckoo bird. The man blessed with peace. What those endure who walk most widely in the path. He keeps coming back to that idea. The person who has an easy life doesn't know what it's like to be wretched. Because to be wretched is to walk in the paths of exile. But again, we, we haven't qualified what kind of exile this is. See, in the wanderer, the wanderer is an exile. Why? All of his kinsmen are dead. He's the last survivor, so to speak, of his tribe, of his people. We're going to see a passage. We're going to see a passage in Baal that's commonly just called the Lay of the Last Survivor, the Song of the Last Survivor. That this guy speaks, you know, and puts a bunch of gold in the ground. You know, um, how does one of the, the all-time supposedly? I've never been able to finish it because it absolutely disgusts me. What is one of the all-time greatest American novels, let's say, of the 19th century? How does it begin? Call me Ishmael. Moby Dick. Who's Ishmael? He's the last survivor of the Pequod. Okay. The book of Job. What repeatedly happens to Job's family, servants, children? They all die. And what happens every time? A servant comes running to Job. Job, your sons and daughters. Job, your cattle. Job, your house. And I alone am escaped to tell thee. The rhyme of the ancient mariner. And I alone am escaped. We get this idea of this last survivor, okay? So he says, the person who is blessed with ease, the person who hasn't had any troubles in life, he doesn't know what those endure. Who must walk widely in the paths of exile? Right? But we don't know why he's on this exile other than my heart, the urging of my heart thoughts to try myself, try for myself, the high seas, the tossing airspace. I'm going to get back to this idea of escasis, right? And so, And so now my thought flies out from my breast. My spirit moves with the sea flood, roams widely over the whale's home. Whale's home is a kinning. It's prawn, rather, if I remember right, if you're in the old English. Juanus Edo. Literally, he translates it. The whale's home. It's a kinning. K-E-N-N-I-N-G which is a figure of speech. Best way to translate a kinning is a metaphor of a metaphor. A metaphor where you compare two things without using like or as. So it's a comparison of a comparison. So what's the whale's road? The whale's home. The ocean. So why not just translate it as the ocean? Uh, the, the whale's home, to the corners of the earth, and come back to me greedy and hungry. So the thought flies out, goes off over the ocean, comes back hungry. What might that be symbolic of? Or allegorical of, possibly? What happens when the rain stops in the flood of Noah? Noah opens up a window and sends a bird out, right? I can't remember what it is. A dove or something. And what does it do? It flies all around and comes back. Why? No place to land. So his thought goes out all over and comes back greedy and hungry. Why? No place to get food out there. It returns. The lone flyer cries out and 
what love was. Incites my heart irresistibly to thee, Wales bound, over the open sea. The lone flyer cries out, it's like, I'm not saying it is, it's like the speaker's spirit, or possibly in ears, hears the sound of the ocean, or an ocean bird, and it kind of goes, and it draws him to it. Maybe there's a kind of music that does that to me, or does that to you. For me, bagpipes, if they're well played, always kind of awakens big, huge of my ancestry is Scottish. And it, I think there's something ingrained so that you hear bagpipes or Lillian pipes, Irish pipes, and it's going to like, come home, come home. In Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, we're told, if an elf hears the sound of the ocean, the elf will never be happy where he or she is. Legolas Greenwood is a trio. He's warned, you hear the ocean, man, you're going to want to go across. Right? So, incites my heart irresistibly to the whale's path over the open seas. Why? Now we're getting at the reason for the exile. Because hotter to me are the joys of the Lord than this dead life. Loaned. Old English, land now. Exact same word we saw in the wanderer. Here, this fell land. Here is wealth lady. Here, this freon land. Here is friend fleeting. Here is woman fleeting. Here is life fleeting. Or loan. It's exact same word, exact same spell. And yet here it gets translated loan, and then the wanderer leaves it, translates it as fleeting. So, hotter to me are the joys of the Lord than this dead, dead life. What kind of phrase is that? Oxymoron? Virgin mother? Uh, can't be both. Paradox? That is, it seems like an oxymoron, and yet it bears a deeper truth. Then this dead life loaned. See, that's why it's dead. The speaker is saying, we don't know it here. But we're the walking dead. We're already dead. We just aren't aware of it yet. So if we're already dead, we better know where we're going. So he says, the joys of the Lord are hotter to me than this dead life. What's part of this dead life? What were we told earlier? You know, his feet are cold, right? And yet around his heart, seethe, that's hotness, all these cares and troubles. Now he says, the joys of the Lord, they're even hotter. They're more desirable. I was hoping to get to line eight. We'll stop there. We're more than halfway. Just barely. We'll stop there and pick up with line 66 on Wednesday, because Monday is Labor Day.